Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Reva Feinstein, Associate Dean for Development and Alumni Relations at Columbia Nursing, and welcome. Welcome to Virtually Speaking, a Columbia Nursing webinar series. Today's program is a nursing pioneer, Florence Nightingale. Our office presents these virtual events periodically on a variety of topics, and we hope you can join us for future programs. So before starting, just a few quick housekeeping items. Um, thank you to all who submitted questions ahead of time. We'll address those later in the event. And please note that everyone except our speakers will be muted. Um, kindly utilize the chat feature at the bottom of your screen if you have any new questions today. We will be monitoring those and time permitting, we'll address them at the end. And lastly, thank you in advance for your patience in case we have any technical glitches. We don't anticipate them, but... Um, and then finally, I would like to introduce today's moderator. Um, it is 2008 and 2014 graduate uh, Kenrick Cato, assistant professor at Columbia Nursing, and also a board member of the Columbia University School of Nursing Alumni Association. Dr. Cato, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Reva. Um, so I'm very excited to join everyone today to celebrate Florence Nightingale and her remarkable legacy. Um, I think one of the reasons I was chosen to moderate is when we were uh, choosing the actual um, art for our new building, and I hope everyone has a chance eventually to see our new building because it's wonderful. I was asked to submit uh, a potential uh, piece of uh, art or photo in um, what we call our theme walls close to the elevator on our sixth floor, which is uh, where most of the research faculty are, are housed. And I suggested um, the Nightingale Rose, which for me as a clinical inform informatician, so I study clinical informatics and I study how we can help clinicians make better decisions um, using electronic inf uh, patient information. Um, the Nightingale Rose, which is a actual uh, visualization that was uh, that Florence Nightingale created or published in 1858, is a depiction of the causes and casualties of death in the Crimean War for the British Army, and um, to this day, it is still um, that visualization or that form of visualization is still used in my field in clinical informatics. And it is really a remarkable piece of um, statistical thinking for its time. And, um, and it's something that I think about um, very regularly. And it's something that I think about in my work, how to visualize both longitudinal information and information in depth in a way that an individual can look at and, and understand right away. And so Florence Nightingale you know, is such an amazing person because she was able to impact not only nursing, but also statistics and visualization um, in a way that still is true today. So, so um, thank you for being here with us. And um, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Vice Dean Judy Honig. Thank you, Kenrick. I'm also honored to be part of this event focusing on a very courageous woman who was a pioneer and a legend in the nursing community. I believe that I share many of Florence's values, the conviction that everyone has the right to good health care and a safe medical environment, and that health care workers should be given a well-rounded education. As many will recall, we initially planned to celebrate the bicentennial of N Nightingale's birth with an alumni trip to London this fall, this past fall. And we were planning to visit some key sites that were, th that were part of the life of this exceptional woman, but we had to postpone due to COVID. Instead, as this year of the nurse and midwife draws to a close, we're honored to have Anne Marie Rafferty join us today from the UK. Dr. Rafferty is a professor of nursing policy and the former Dean of the Florence Nightingale Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery at King's College of London. Her research interests combine history, health policy and health services research. We are immensely grateful and excited to hear a talk with us about the legacy of Florence Nightingale. Well, thank you, Judy, and thank you, uh, Kendrick and Reva. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, I know it's 
here means many things at this moment <laughs> in time. And uh, truly uh, in, in, inspired to talk to you today about Nightingale's legacy and what she might mean for us today. And uh, Columbia's uh, School of Nursing is, is a, also of great historic importance. So I think that adds another layer of uh, fascination, certainly for, for me. Um, I want to acknowledge my um, debt to collaborators uh, and people who helped me put some of the data and the slides together for this presentation. And uh, just to give you a glimpse into Nightingale as a character, and of course, as a celebrity as well, which she was in her own li lifetime. I think Judy's already, already referred to her kind of legendary status. But look, uh, take a look, as Kendrick's already uh, alluded to, to her contribution to nursing and, be and beyond that. Um, because nursing was actually only a re relatively minor part <laughs> of her uh, lifetime achievements, although for us it's the most significant perhaps. And let's just consider why is it she remains this, um, this constant uh, in our own kind of pantheon of, hero, of heroes and heroines in nursing today, and not just for us, but for many other people from different disciplines. Well. Here she is, I've, I've just, you know, mocked her up as a kind of Andy Warhol lookalike. She, of course, had more than her 15 minutes of fame, but I think this just epitomises the celebrity status that Nightingale had during her own, her own lifetime. Um, perhaps one day she might be portrayed in the Guggenheim, who knows, um, just down the road from you. But even before she set foot on Crimean soil, she was being claimed as, as a national heroine. And partly that was because the Crimean War was a, such a controversial and abysmal failure, it has to be said, for the British government. There were no obvious heroes of the day. There was no Wellington, there was no Nelson. And so somehow, Florence stepped into the breach and she became lauded and applauded um, re really before she actually ac accomplished uh, very much at all. And it would be a very interesting study, I think, to look at all the, the material culture and the songs, the poems and outpouring of, of acclaim that she received um, as a consequence of her, her decision but obviously that was made jointly through her good offices with uh, Sidney Herbert, who's then Secretary of War. But her, her, her achievements have been well documented. I mean, any scholar of Nightingale, you know, Lynn MacDonald from Canada has produced a 16 volume annotated um, uh, oeuvre of Nightingale's writings and analysis. I mean, it's, it's a huge encyclopedic kind of work and I want to pay tribute to that. But for me, getting a glimpse into her character, I think the person who's really excelled in that is Mark Bostrich, who's a British biographer. And he produced a biography for 2010, which was in fact the centenary of Nightingale's death. So we can always find excuses to keep celebrating Nightingale. It's a bicentenary of her birth in 2020. And my colleague Siobhan Nelson and, and myself also produced an edited collection, which was trying to bring some of the historical scholarship up to date at that time, but also fast forward to the present and look at that issue of the, the enduring influence of her as, as an icon. But I've included this other book, um, Suggestions for Thought by Nightingale herself, to give you a kind of little window into the prodigious um, and restless nature of her in highly impressive intellect. I mean, this was someone who was on a quest, on a mission, and that took her into many different uh, uh, intellectual arenas of which theology and mysticism 
were but part. And she was rather pursued and consumed by this question about how to do good in the world. And inevitably being uh, a Victorian, that involved uh, reflection on religion and its many forms and manifestations. And she was very interested in comparative religion as, as well and what they could learn from each other. And she came, as Lynn MacDonald uh, has, has already written, from a, a really a liberal kind of high Whig reformist tradition, very much a progressive in, in the, the manner of a number of uh, 19th century liberal causes and, you know, falling in the slipstream of um, anti-slavery and trying to make society a better place. That was really her, her great conviction. But I think this work here by Val Webb also tries to explore her religious ruminations and exertions. I think she was someone who was really um, very concerned about, about her own um, spiritual status as an individual and, uh, and was uh, very, I think, um, wide ranging in the sort of range of belief systems that she brought into her thinking. She was a real synthesizer, uh, what we would call a syncretic kind of, of thinker as well. So it's clear even from that little sort of uh, excursion that Nightingale was a woman of prodigious interests as well as gifts and whose formidable intellect enabled her to cross um, what we would now call disciplinary boundaries, but which the Victorians, of course, didn't really recognise in the same in the same way because they were they were part of uh, those disciplines weren't specialised to the same degree that they that they are now in terms of you know the way universities are structured, etc. But um, the other places that were very remarkable and important to Nightingale were our homes, and there's three of them here. One in London, the London flat on the left, one in Leehurst in Derbyshire, where her family made her fortune and enabled her actually to have a very comfortable upper middle class lifestyle. Um, she wasn't employed, that was not something that women of her standing actually did have to work for a living. And she of course was maintained through her life by her father. But the, the house down the bottom, when her father inherited quite a, a fortune from her, his uh, uncle, was really quite a show-off house, um, designed to demonstrate the cultural capital and taste uh, of the Nightingale household. And indeed, of course, to entertain the local gentry who just happened to be on either side, almost equidistant from Embley Park in Hampshire. Um, on the one hand, Sidney Herbert, who became a great family friend and was of course very influential in Florence's decision to go to the, the Crime, he really recruited her. But also Lord Palmerston, who would later become Prime Minister during the Crimean War. So imagine just fortuitously being juxtaposed between these two uh, men who would exert such a, a kind of uh, totemic influence upon her own decisions. And the Nightingale drawing room, the people who passed over the threshold and were wined and dined in the Nightingale household, of course, were the great and the good, the, the intellectual, the scientific, the political aristocracy of the day. You've got Lord Palmerston up top left, Darwin. She, Nightingale, after she came back from the Crimea, went to Bal was invited to Balmoral by Queen Victoria. And in fact, I think Queen Victoria actually made a little jewel for Nightingale. But she was connected with the literary establishment. There's Mrs. Gaskell um, down at the bottom, Sidney Herbert above. So, I mean, imagine being in, in that email year and having those fascinating conversations. Um, you know, um, Kendrick mentioned, you know, the, the Rose Diagram, I'll talk a little bit about that, but you know, Charles Babbage, who uh, also was a highly gifted math mathematician and you know, credited with the beginnings of building computational capability and eventually you know, 
um, computers, of course, that's many years later, but laying some of the foundations, the sort of intellectual foundations for that. And he was also a friend of, of the family. Boonson, uh, the great scientist who's the, you know, the scientific instrument has, has he led his name to, uh, was also a regular visitor. So, gosh, it must have been absolutely brilliant to be uh, at one of those dinner parties. Maybe we should recreate a Nightingale dinner party next time you come over, you come over to London, let's do it. So, um, but Nightingale was, when you read some of her writings, you do get this impression that she was someone who was very, well, to say she was obsessed by it's probably a little too strong, but deeply uh, concerned with uh, what she should really do with her, her life and kind of reflecting on it. And she wanted to do something useful. She was really critical of the status of Victorian womanhood. And she wrote this novella in uh, 1953. It wasn't actually published till 1920s, part of a kind of feminist uh, treatise on the history of suffrage. And she had quite complicated views in relation to feminism, women's suffrage. But, you know, bottom line is that she was against the Sort of enforced idleness as she, as she mentioned uh, or referred to as Victorian women. She couldn't stand sitting in the drawing room doing nothing but needlework or reading. She wanted to be out there and making an impact in the world, some, doing something practical and I think that's probably why she you know was a rebel that she bucked convention and she chose nursing because that was probably the ultimate rebellion from a woman of, of her class and um, and of course she could have gone into medicine. She was very friendly with um, Elizabeth Blackwell and um, other leading lights of, of medicine at, at, at the time, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson as well, um, the first women physicians, but she decided to do nursing. I, I do think it's just because it was so practical and she had this faith that basically what could medicine do it had very limited potential in the middle of the 19th century. And what did you have? You had, you know, opiates and, and more or less, and one or two other therapeutics, but very little that was effective. So that's my little take on why she chose nursing, apart from the fact that it was quite a, a rebellious thing to do as well, which perhaps she, she enjoyed, of, <laughs> you know, I think she enjoyed standing up to authority as we will discover. When she eventually got to the Crimea, she certainly had to stand up to authority, to the, med uh, the military bureaucracy in order to maintain uh, and secure a supply chain, uh, very much as we've found with PPE now. I'll talk a little bit about that, that later. You know, the logistics was what she excelled at. I mean, she was just a brilliant, had a brilliant administrative a brain, which is how she got into using data as a way of classifying um symptoms and classifying um different different phenomena and, and measurement of health systems and services but here she is immortalized very early on by the poet longfellow and that captured the public imagination the lady with the lamp when you know she was more or less catapulted into the squalor of scutari built above a sewer and that was the first thing that needed to be cleaned up when she got there she said can't have this and, you know, all of the wherewithal to do that, she was very deeply unimpressed by the military inertia and resistance that she, that she um, encountered. But here was William Howard Hastings, who was um, a, a journalist with the Times, had it not actually been for him and his writings back to London and some of the little etchings that he did to go with his... Um, his writings, I don't actually think, I mean, he was probably the first war reporter, that the Crimea scandal as such would have burst on the political scene with anything like the impact that it did. And the British public were appalled. And one of the, the lines that was scrutinised and stood out in um, Howard Hastings' writing was that where are, you know, the Ch Sir de Charité in France, there were French nurses and nuns out there in the Crimea, but there was none from Britain. And of course, this became a cause celebre of the Rose diagram that um, 
Kendrick's just met, just referred to. He's done all the work I need to do and explaining what this is, but comparatively, it was looking at the, the casualties versus um, the want and neglect and infections of good care, why pe what people were dying from. And it was really the want of good care um, and, in, and infections rather than battle wounds. And she very demonstrated that and expressed it very economically and, and, and graphically. And not only did she do that, but she actually designed data systems as well um, in order to begin to sh show comparisons of different hospital systems and how they performed. And she wanted to standardize those data collection methods so that they could be benchmarked against each other. The 19th century was a great time of international meetings and congresses of various sort of which the International um, Congress on Statistics was, was one looking at public health and other types of, of issues. But her hero was a Belgian statistician and social scientist called Adolf Ketelet. Some of you who studied diabetes may know of the Ketelet Index, a kind of for, forerunner of BMI um, um, index. And, um, and he was very interested in what we'd now call normal distribution and invented the whole concept of the mean. So if you had a mean, then you could calculate, you know, standard deviations from it. And that was what really fascinated Nightingale um, about that variation in hospitals that, 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 that ostensibly should be performing in, in a rather similar kind of way. And I think that's relevant today, not only because Nightingale was using evidence as a tool, as a powerful tool to persuade policymakers of a point of view, essentially as a rhetorical device, but because the way you present information, we now know that from, um, you know, neuro-linguistic program and, and the ways in which we respond. And of course, marketing's got this down to a fine, a fine art, but actually it's about how we respond emotionally as well as intellectually and behavioral economics and nudge theory. And these are all sort of the sequelae to some of the tactics that Nightingale was very aware of and how she wrote and how she presented data and writing, well, read her books. I mean, her language is exquisite. She's so eloquent on the fundamentals of nursing care, um, fresh, the fresh air warmth, uh, ventilation, hygiene. These are all encapsulated in Notes on Nursing, published in 1859, a classic. And the blockbuster, it sold 50,000 copies in the first month, which, all, I mean, how many authors can claim that? to their name nowadays. And it's just so beautifully crafted as, as, a, as a piece of rhetoric. In fact, I was thinking of sending one, I didn't quite get round to it because I got COVID myself um, at the beginning of lockdown um, for International Nurses Day um, to, to Boris Johnson, who's a great fan of rhetoric and saying, you know, more or less, well, you won't find a better example uh, than, than, than this. Um, and it, 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 but it's very much appealing to looking after people in their own homes and how to optimize that. And, but the attention to detail in it is just quite profound and seriously in, in, impressive. Coaxing people who with little appetite with, which actually you do have with COVID it has to be said, um, with little delicacies, dainty delicacies. And so she was incredibly thoughtful as a clinician. I think this book gives you an insight into how intelligent um, the, 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 her approach was in terms of, you know, emotional intelligence, as well as the, the, the sort of design features of a good experience for patients. And it is relevant, I think, through the COVID experience today, because, well, most many people were living, uh, having to contend with COVID in their own homes without very much in the way of support. And she also attends to the kind of psychological dimensions. So I think she's very much, you know, in the sort of modern trend of where we are today as well. And of course, design architecture were absolutely central, front, front and center in her thinking, how to design hospitals so that, that to avoid cross infection and the pavilion model was something that she 
pioneered. She published in The Builder, which was an architectural uh, magazine and a periodical. And of course, the, the basics of this still remain at St Thomas's um, today. So, you know, that can add that to your tour. But it was very much about de designing <coughs> the practice and therapeutic environment that she was so thoughtful over. And of course, research today, the practice environment and the therapeutic environment, we're now very interested in reducing noise in ITU to keep patients comfortable help them sleep. Um, and we know that noise, for example, in uh, what we call the, the kind of perinatal, um, neonatal intensive care units has a direct physiological effect on neonate um, welfare. Blood pressure goes up when doors are banging and such like. So again, she anticipated uh, some elements of that. Um, and again, she wrote in Notes in Hospital, published in 1863, about the distance that should be le left between hospital beds to avoid um, infection. And indeed, the materiality of a sick room. What type of plaster should there be on the walls to reduce the absorption of these noxious fumes? Because she was, of course, someone who believed in miasma and contagion. Although she did actually acknowledge germ theory later on in her life, some people say that, you know, she was way behind the times and that she didn't, act, she did acknowledge um, Koch and Pasteur's teaching. Um, and uh, not only that, but even this just shows how, how kind of thorough and, and diligent she was and meticulous she was in her, in her thinking and science, the scientific forensic nature of her thinking. Um, what should a mattress be made of? Should it be made of horsehair? or straw, were, were these more repellent, was one more repellent of infection than the other? I mean, amazing. Prescience in terms of what preoccupies us today and the procurement therefore of those, of those elements. So yeah, she wasn't an advocate first off the bat of germ theory, but she did come round to uh, subscribe to it. And of course, all of her teachings on hygiene are so relevant to us today especially when, of course, we're, we're confronting a virus that, you know, basically is, is, is something which is so resistant to um, any of the usual kinds of weapons that we might throw at it. But maybe just to kind of move into the contemporary, uh, more into the contemporary and the organisational and workforce type of issues. This is an article published in The Atlantic, and it was looking to the future about you know, where is, where, well, of course, this was pre-COVID, where, where are we heading? And um, the big growth areas for uh, the economy from the Bureau of the Labour Statistics in the US, and this has been somewhat replicated in the UK, are care computers and clean energy. And like nursing is at the intersection of the future of work, as well as the, 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 the workforce it's, itself. So I think that's actually something we don't really capitalise on to our, to our advantage as much as we might. But the shifting demographics and demand show that more people are having more and more things wrong with them and therefore the demand for nursing is itself growing. And this is a book that we published last year looking at the nursing as a kind of major source of resilience and strengthening health, health systems and doing a comparative analysis across different countries in, in Europe. This again was pre Brexit, it's easy to see that things become so out of date so, so quickly. But research that I've had the pleasure of, of, of collaborating on, Linda Aiken being the great luminary, and I would say, you know, very much following in that research tradition of Florence Nightingale, um, looking at big data, demonstrating in, in, our, in our European research that uh, staffing levels impact on patient outcomes. Um, this was, of course, had not been established before. Yes, it had been in Linda's research in, in the US, but, but not across um, multiple jurisdictions in, in Europe. And the same went for education. Better, ed we take it for granted. That's why we're all in higher education. Education's a good thing and nurses need to be really well educated. Well, of course, we still have some skeptics, people who don't believe that, but this evidence that it's not just uh, the numbers of nurses, it's how well they're educated 
that makes a difference. And if you start to model that and manage, you know, titrate the, the workload for for uh, nurses and so have a one to six nurse to patient ratio, 60% of nurses in uh, a complement of, of care that would enable us to save more than three and a half, we reckon three and a half thousand deaths a year across Europe. So with these manipulations and uh, modeling uh, exercises, you can start to form policy but of course, you know, now we're in a pandemic and burnout and distress and anxiety and even PTSD are, are growing features of the problems that are being uh, showed up for, for the future. And therefore, the design uh, discipline that Nightingale brought to care is even more important than in crafting those solutions. And certainly these uh, design principles have been used to improve you know, human factors and quality improvement projects, uh, as well as the patient pathways that we rely on. And Nightingale's name also has lent itself to our field hospitals that we developed across the UK. Um, these huge, uh, literally almost aircraft hangars, 4,000 ICU beds, which were developed in London to deal with the surge, thankfully, uh, they weren't needed to anything like the extent that we thought they might be because we extended capacity quite efficiently. And this is um, Nightingale in, in her, her flat in London. Of course, she retreated from society and, and actually um, spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in, in seclusion. Um, maybe, you know, the way in which celebrities retreat from society uh, it's also a very efficient way to, to, to organise your working life. Make people come to you. You don't have to go to them and have all those, all those Zoom meetings. But I think that actually um, Nightingale would have adapted because she was used to spending a lot of time on her own. I think she's probably, in Myers-Briggs terms, an introvert. Um, I think she would have adapted really well to, to, to lockdown and all of her teachings of hygiene would have, would have uh, come very much to, to the fore and protecting the health of nurses as well, which she was also very keen on, which I think we've been less adept at doing. But in addition to that, I think she would also welcome um, the, the developments in informatics and in big data, machine learning and, and AI. I think she would be wanting to use that to great effect to improve the quality of care not only that, though, she would be getting her messages out to the major global decision fora where, uh, you know, global health policy is actually being formulated. She would be talking probably via someone else reading a speech from her or maybe teleporting in via Zoom into the World Health Assembly and, you know, telling Dr. Tedros what he's got to do. She would have no hesitation, I think, and I'm hope, I'm sure she would be an ally of Dr. Tedros as well, but she'd probably be saying, you need more nurses at headquarters and across WHO um, as, as a whole, you need to strengthen that nurse leadership. But it's not just in the health arenas that we need to make our voices heard. It's finance ministers, as well as we've heard in the, in the report on the State of the World's Nursing Report. So this is from 2019. Who's coming to Davos? Well, no nurses, as far as I'm aware. We have got to infiltrate some of those fora because that's where a lot of major decisions that impact on health systems are actually made. And there is a, a health forum as part of the Davos and, uh, and nurses are, are highly productive. You know, we, we add value to, to health. So, we need to find ways and, and through informatics and, and other, you know, our entrepreneurship to get our voices actually heard, not just there in G20. Um, we could treble, quadruple um, to the power 10, the numbers of women who are represented at these kind of four at G20 global economic summits. And they also have a health minister's summit. So we need to influence 
who the people are that are going to these summits and the agendas and the decisions that they're taking because that's what boomerangs back on us. That's where budgetary discussions are held. That has a huge impact on how resources are developed and, you know, uh, the work on, on inequalities and closing the gap on, on in inequalities and, and health disparities. That's where we need to be influencing at that macroeconomic as well as the kind of micro uh, level. So just to finish on, give the final word to Florence herself. You know, she was bang on the money here. Unless we're making progress every year, every month, every week, take my word for it, we are going back. And going back, although we're talking about history here, is not where we're going. But we've definitely pulled some lessons from history that help us to spring, I hope, forward and build back a better future um, in this, in a, hopefully we will have a post-COVID world. And thank you for listening. And um, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, that was um, amazing. And um, it's always great to, to learn more about Florence Nightingale and see, uh, you know, to just kind of see more, uh, more of the depth of her influence. Um, before I start with the questions, I want to remind everyone um, to that we have the chat open, and so it'd be great as we speak to um, just enter any questions that you might have into the chat window, so that um, we can ask Dr. Rafferty. Um, so uh, I'd like to start off with a question of my own, and, the, and then um, we can move to some other questions. So you'd mentioned um, sending notes on nursing uh, to Boris, um, you're a fearless leader. And I'm just wondering, you know, so we had uh, a, a question that was sent to us um, before, um, previous to the um, talk, and, and, they, and uh, this individual asked, you know, when you when you think about the notes in nursing and um, some of the essential points that Florence Nightingale talked about, those would be pure air, pure water, efficient, um, efficient drainage and cleanliness and light. Um, you alluded to the fact that they're just as pertinent now as they were 160 years ago. Um, do you do you think if if uh, and this is you know going into the head of Florence Nightingale, but do you think if if we practice what she preached, that that would have helped to mitigate some of the effects of the COVID pandemic that we're in right now? Thanks, Kendrick, and thanks for the question. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I hope I've conveyed the sense that I think uh, that would have helped a great deal. But I guess the, you know, the, 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 the context of, of, of COVID has, you know, forced us almost to fall back on some of the, the, the hygiene principles that she held very dear. In fact, hand washing is something that she refers to in notes on, on nursing. And that's now we know, I mean, so critical for trying to reduce cross infection as, as well. Um, and I think there's, there's a, a sort of new found interest in some of her teachings as a consequence of that. But it's clear that it requires huge reorganization of our current, uh, what we might call plan, our current estate in order to make, you know, some of those things possible. But, you know, I know that ICUs are being redesigned so that people can look out um, eventually onto green, you know, um, green sort of visual scapes that that in itself has been shown to be therapeutic and, and associated with better, better outcomes. So light is tremendously important. So I do think her teachings in that regard are a coda for today. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, so we have a question um, from Joy Favazua. I uh, apologize if I did not um, get the name last name correct, but Joy asks if if she were to um, read just one book on Florence Nightingale, which book would you recommend? And also, did she write more? Um, did she write more than than 
on on books, which one would you recommend that I that she reads? I do think honestly, Notes on Nursing is is a great a great read. I mean, partly because of the aesthetics of the language that Nightingale uses. She has all of these, she was a real stylist. So, I mean, I think English literature scholars would, would find her of, of great interest as well as to how she crafted her language, um, which was to land, you know, that's why I'm talking about her as a kind of um, a mistress, if you like, of, of rhetoric. Um, her language is designed very much to to impress and, and to persuade almost quite imperceptibly those it's not a sort of in your face type uh, argument it's gentle it's nudging you along a, a line of, of argument um, and sort of pulling you with with her you're sort of walking with her so I, I think the 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 style and eloquence with which she actually wrote is, uh, is as much, it's as important as the substance of actually what she was saying. It's not what she was saying, it was how she was, how she was saying it. It's, it's just, it's just beautifully written. Um, so I would, yeah, notes on nursing. It's a belter. It's a winner. Go for it, Joy. <laughs> Go for it. Um, and so, um, Another question that that occurred to me when you were you were actually giving the background um, and just talking more about the milieu um, in which Florence Nightingale um, operated, uh, the intellectual milieu, it seemed it seemed like you know there was a lot of intellectual kind of ferment going on, and I wonder when you look back at uh, the environment that she was in what you would say about um, how those different influences might uh, be reflected in potential um, uh, nursing education today um, and what you know what you think uh, would what would Florence Nightingale say about the the, ele the essential elements of nursing education um, uh, to be a successful nurse leader today. Thanks, Kendrick. I think she, you know, she was very concerned with moral, the moral standing of the nurse. And that was very much a, a, something that exercised a lot of Victorians, you know, the state of your soul and your kind of moral probity and behavior um, there was a great value placed on, on that, um, the, mo the moral worth and how you would demonstrate that as well. So you did that, you demonstrated it by, by you know, by behave, behaviour. And I think, you know, trying to be a good Christian, because she was a Christian, a good Christian women in this in this instance and live a good life according to the teachings and tenets of of um, the gospel so you know it, it's it's very much in, in tied up with um, a sort of moral fervor and education was about education in certain really Christian virtues you know kindness generosity Modesty, tremendously important to in Nightingale's teachings. She's, she used to write a letter to probationers uh, once a year, and she was very concerned with nurses becoming conceited and getting above themselves. I mean, it seems strange that <laughs> that would be one of the one of the kind of fears. But this thing about status and standing and becoming, you know, over getting an inflated sense of your own importance because you have some knowledge. And I think she wants, it's not that she wanted people to stay in their place and nurses not to challenge, you know, doctors. Far from it. She believed a little knowledge was really dangerous because you might think, ha, I know what to do in this instance. And it would kind of 
upset the apple cart. But what she did want was to, to be to be well versed and intelligent in their approach to obedience, which didn't mean slavishly following orders regardless of, of their integrity. So I think she wanted nurses to underst you know, understand their limitations um, and their roles, their scope of practice as we would call it today, but to be well grounded in the art and the science of, of nursing itself, but exquisite observers of human behaviour. And I think that's one of the things that's so apparent from her writings is what an exquisitely skilled and, and attuned uh, observer she was of humankind as well as of, of, of patients. So it's quite a complex kind of mix to do with understanding the science and how to put, of course, she says this in the nurse thing, the patient in the best position for nature to act upon them. That was the role of nursing because, as I mentioned, we didn't really have much at our disposal. So the onus on the nurse was even more profound than it was on the doctor because nurses could make or break. She really understood this. Nurses could make or break the welfare and outcomes for patients, as she had seen by virtue of their attentiveness, their scrupulousness, or their neglect. And I think that's why she was so concerned about the moral kind of tutelage uh, of, of nurses, that that was a guarantee of quality, how nurses' behaviour could be nudged into a good fit with ensuring that patients were well, were well cared for. Um, so it's a part, you know, it's quite a modernist kind of um, theory, if you, if you like. Um, but yes, yeah, nurses had to be well versed in the theory and, and the practice of their craft and reflecting on it because she also believed that nurses should not just be observers, but they should note their observations. And she suggested that probationers should keep diaries, you know, like we do, reflective diaries. They should keep diaries of patients and understand what is helpful and what is less helpful. And so that required, you know, a conversation to happen um, through learning. And um, I mean, you know, she didn't, I mean, this is all done from a kind of strange context of not stepping foot inside St. Thomas's Hospital once it was, once it was built and the training school in 1860. Um, she didn't actually stand in front of a class of nurse probationers. Everything was done very much from a distance. So again, I think she'd be very comfortable with, you know, online learning platforms. And I think she would be at the forefront of those developments of blended approaches to learning and using the latest tech. She would be wowed by that, but she would be wowing the techie people as well, <laughs> I have no doubt. Um, so we just had a question come in and I was wondering, um, Judy, if you could address this question. Um, and the question is, um, does uh, Nightingale's teachings, does Columbia University embrace them? And um, are there currently any lectures on Nightingale's leadership? Uh, I'm sure in our, like, in our history course for the MDE students, she is definitely part of the Nightingale, um, of the nursing heritage and legacy and, and is mm -hmm. addressed. I don't know that we have, um, we don't have lectures on, on Nightingale's leadership per se. This is, this is one that we're, we're doing. Uh, we, we are inviting um, a, a historian to talk about the history of nursing. And when you talk about the history of nursing, Nightingale has to be part of that, part of that discussion, part of that. It, it, she is so much a part of our history. And being, celebrating the year of the nurse and midwife, it, it's come up many times, not in a class, but in presentations and, um, and other activities. But we, we do address it when we talk about history and the MDE students get that in their uh, program. Honestly, I don't know how much history is in the 
DNP program or the PhD program to really speak to that. Great, thank you. Um, Anne-Marie, I have another question. So um, you obviously have spent a lot of time studying Florence Nightingale and, and uh, kind of related to that would be understand, studying and understanding the Victorian era. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could speak to a little bit because I know, you know, Florence Nightingale is, is a historical figure. Mm -hmm. And um, could you, I think it's, it's fascinating um, when you think about historical figures and try to understand and compare them to, um, to where we are now. Could you just spend a little bit of time? I know this is, you know, people spend their whole careers talking about this, but just kind of talking a little bit more about the context of Victorian era and, and how, that, um, how, how that would have shaped Florence Nightingale. Well, I think the first thing to say, Kendrick, is that she lived quite a long time, 90 years. So, you know, she covered um, perhaps different eras within that, um, within that time as well. And it was a period of, I think you used the word ferment, and I think that's so appropriate, of great political upheaval as well. Um, not least in terms of, let's even take the church. And we're talking about all the convulsions that were uh, impacting the Church of England and the rise of um, different evangelical religions. So that were challenging the authority of the established church in England at the time. So that was really a massive kind of uh, movement, which also was reflected in nursing because, and I'm thinking now, not just in, in the established church, but the Oxford movement, which was coming out of Catholicism, was spawned um, religious orders came were by products partly of some of those developments as well. And of course, it was mainly women of religious, from religious orders, were the women who went out to the Crimea and those and the, the party with, with Nightingales. So in some ways, that kind of group of women represented in a sort of microcosm, a lot of that, that ferment and the, the dis dissent, I mean, we're talking about religious dissent here, and infighting that emerged by the different rivalries, which rose up as a consequence of these religious um, disputes and disagreements. And that's partly why, you know, Nightingale had problems out in the Crimea, because, you know, the primary loyalty of a nun, of someone from the sisterhood of St. John's or the Mother Claire, Claire Moore's um, sisters, um, was actually the Catholic and the different stripes of Protestant high church and low church kind of orders, was that your primary loyalty is to the mother's, you know, of the house, the mother superior of your order, not to a secular leader like Florence Nightingale. So there were all these tensions, not just of religions and allegiances, but also of loyalty to this, who is this woman? Florence Nightingale, who, do, who does she think she is taking charge? So it was, it was really, really, really tricky. Um, and there's a fantastic book by a friend of mine that I think really goes into this in, in, in great depth and, and detail called Anne Summers and it's called um, Angels and Citizens and it's about some of the squabbles that developed between that initial party going out to the Crimea. So in a sense Nightingale kind of brought together the, the fulcrum of those discussions and how they worked their way into and through nursing through these diff different religious orders. St John's House was High Anglican. There were the Catholic orders. 
And they all had their own points of disagreement and their kind of rivalrous relationships um, and sort of moral standings on, on care. So try, it was like, it must have been like herding cats for Nightingale trying to get this lot knocked into shape and actually forming a team, yeah. you know, team, team Florence, come on, let's get to it. That, that was not easy at all. At all so, to get so, to have yeah, her so, accepted as a leader, we take it for granted, but it wasn't. She wasn't accepted as a leader by the the military establishment. They were saying, "I'm, you know, the the the, the head honcho, um, Major John, I've forgotten his second name now. Come back to me." Um, thinking, you think I'm taking orders from a woman? You've got to be joking. This wasn't a done thing. And she was saying, I need these supplies, this, that, and other, and eventually, banging her head against a bureaucratic wall, she set up her own um, supply chain and her own fund to get the supplies she needed, shirts, bedsteads, linen, the whole shebang, dressings, the whole shebang. She brought that out to the Crimea herself. It was amazing. She just bypassed authority. Fearless, fearless, a woman of tremendous cut guts courage and determination and not taking no for an answer yeah that's amazing um so i have a, a could, question I, i'm going to say something political yeah. no i shouldn't probably say it, but anyway <laughs> i'll tell you donald trump would not stand a chance with florence nightingale she would just put him right in his box <laughs> so um just related to the difficulties that she encountered um there's a question about um, kind of related to that, did she ever speak of being overwhelmed or regretted any of the actions or um, the or ways that she mm, handled some of the things? Yeah, that's a really great, great question. Do you know, I think she kind of agonized about lots of things. I think she was a bit, this is me, just pop psychology, right? So just take it with a pinch of salt. But I, I, I get the impression that she was someone who really was almost really very exercised by the kind of state of her psyche and her soul. I mean, remember, she nearly died in the Crimea of, of what we think is brucellosis. And I think she probably carried like symptoms of what we might call long COVID, fatigue. You know, people have said she was neurasthenic, she was a hypochondriac, she was this, she was that. I mean, you know, that near-death experience, I think, was deeply traumatic. She probably had a variant of PTSD. So I think we've got to bear that in mind. And I think that kind of bled into other aspects of her life, you know, when she came back to England. And she worked like a fiend. Oh, my goodness. She worked like the devil incarnate in getting her works. These huge reports that she produced and that you've got probably in your archive, which is brilliant. I must go and visit that one day. Um, you know, these are works that, of incredible kind of the effortful. She was, she probably was a bit workaholic, actually, you know. Um, and she drove her collaborators. She collaborated with the best minds and, at the time and getting data sources. But she also drove some of those people into the ground you know, notably her cousin's husband, um, Clough, who is a poet, and Arthur Clough. And, you know, not everyone had her staying power and her kind of stamina, and her, her shared her vision, her determined vision. I think she agonised over the state of many, many things, the state of British Army, the state of India, the state of Aboriginal children's education. I mean, the expansive nature of her intellect and interests was awesome. It's so impressive. Well, so thank impressive. you. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne Marie. We are um, a minute over time. So, you know, um, and I want to thank, thank you, Anne Marie. Thank everyone for joining us. This was a wonderful program. And I hope uh, everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. So um, if you have any further questions, please reach out to the Office of Development and Alumni Relations. I think the office will be sending out some additional information that uh, folks have asked about. 
in the chat window. Again, thank you so much. And um, this has been a wonderful talk. Thank you for having me. Great to talk with you. Yes. Good old Florence. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.